Welcome to Observe, Wonder, Think, a Green Chemistry webinar series. We are so thrilled you are joining us tonight. My name is Erin Mayer, and I am a lead teacher with the MB9. And I am joined this evening by a team of my colleagues who are also very passionate about green chemistry. We are so excited to have Matt Miller, Professor of Chemistry, Biochemistry, and Physics from South Dakota State University, join us for tonight's conversation to share his story of science outreach in South Dakota. To get our evening started, we'd love to learn a little bit about you. Please introduce yourself in the chat by sharing your name, location, and the grade level you represent. Please make sure that the name we see on your screen is the name you would like to have printed on your certificate of attendance for this evening. This is how Beyond Benign gets the names to create those certificates and send them to you. Additionally, if you are comfortable doing so, we welcome and encourage you to share your video feed as it fosters a more intimate and engaging experience. We do understand, of course, that there are occasions when that is not possible, and we are very understanding of that. If you have not done so already, please feel free to join us on social media by following us at Beyond Benign at all the various um, social media um, uh, tools that you see on your screen. We are always excited to see posts um, sharing not only beyond benign content being used, but also the innovative ideas that are being implemented um, by our followers, as well as inspiring stories within the green chemistry community. I would also like to remind everyone that by registering for the webinar series, you've agreed to our code of conduct. We are essentially asking for participants to be kind, accepting, and open, open to varying viewpoints and opinions. The series is being recorded, and while it is expected that the video feed will focus on the presenters, your voice and video feed could appear at some point. So by attending this discussion, you are giving your consent to allow us to post video and or sound of you. As we launch into tonight's webinar series, um, I would also like to uh, read the land acknowledgement from South Dakota State University, where Matt Miller is joining us from. South Dakota State University acknowledges the land it occupies across South Dakota is the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Ochedi Shakotwi, meaning seven council fires, which is the proper name for the people referred to as the Sioux. We acknowledge that before these sites were named South Dakota State University, they were called home by people of American Indian nations indigenous to this region. The tribal alliance made up of individual bands of the seven council fires is based on kinship, location, and dialects. Santee, Dakota, Yankton, Nakota, and Teton, Lakota. We acknowledge the sovereignty of the nine federally recognized Native nations in South Dakota, Cheyenne River, Crow Creek, Flandreau Santee, Lower Brule, Oglala, Rosebud, Sisseton, Wapedon, Standing Rock, and Yankton Sioux tribes. As a land-grant university, it is our mission to provide access to higher education to all. We are committed to building respectful and positive relationships with indigenous communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, extension programs, and enrollment efforts. We would also like to give thanks to our sponsors who make this series possible. Aaron, As many of you, we're getting, yes. some, we're getting some feedback from you, I think. If you have, I don't know if you have headphones or what, or I do. it's either Aaron or getting some feedback. Okay. Are you still getting it? Okay. Um, so Beyond B9 is an organization working to foster a green chemistry community that empowers educators to transform chemistry education for a sustainable future. It's our vision to ensure the chemical building blocks of products used every day are healthy and safe for humans and for the environment. And we wholeheartedly believe that education is the most powerful and critical component to achieving this. This is why we are committed to pioneering a paradigm shift across the continuum of science education. The reality is there is a huge demand for green chemistry skills, and we currently do not have the workforce equipped to solve sustainability problems using chemistry. We are so excited to feature presenters in our Observe Wonder Things webinar series who are working to change this. Additionally, in October of last year, the Green Chemistry Teaching and Learning Community launched this joint initiative between Beyond Benign and the ACS Green Chemistry Institute with support from the sponsors 
is a space for all of us to share, connect, learn, and grow. It's a GCTLC hosted central online searchable library of green chemistry education resources, including but certainly not limited to lab experiments, lecture materials, and in-class activities. The hub allows users to create, connect, and network together, share ideas and resources, collaborate, and give and receive feedback, as well as mentorship. We encourage all participants this evening to join this amazing community if you have not already so. As many of you know, this year our Observe Wonder Think webinar series is highlighting the 12 principles of green chemistry with short engaging classroom learning activities and outreach programs. This evening we will focus on green chemistry principles 1 and 12. Before we hear from Matt, I'd like to take a moment to briefly review these two principles since they will be the focus this evening. The Green Chemistry Principle 1 states, it is better to prevent waste than it is to treat or clean up waste after it has been created. This principle is often referred to as the prevention principle. The other 11 principles are the how-tos to achieve Principle 1. Matt's outreach work also focuses on Principle 12, safer chemistry for accident prevention. According to the American Chemistry Society, safety can be defined as the control of recognized hazards to achieve an acceptable level of risk. Green Chemistry Principle 12 is known as the safety principle. This principle is the logical outcome of many of the other principles. In fact, it is practically impossible to achieve the goals of Principle 12 without implementation of at least one of the other green chemistry principles. Eliminating exposure before it can occur should be the level of safety that we are all reaching for. Without further ado, I would like to introduce tonight's presenter. Matt Miller, originally from Northwest Ohio, grew up on the farm. He attended the University of South Dakota and earned a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry Education in 1985, after which he taught nine years of high school physics, chemistry, and physical science in the Hazel Green, Wisconsin at Southwestern High School. Matt then received a Master's of Science in analytical chemistry in 1998 and a PhD in chemistry specializing in chemical education in 2001 from Purdue University. Matt has taught and been involved in chemical education research at South Dakota State University since 2001. As a final reminder, as we get started, our goal tonight is to engage in an interactive session. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat. And it is my pleasure to turn over the dialogue to Matt Miller. Well, thank you, Erin. Um, so um, yes, uh, I'm, I'm very glad to be uh, presenting to the group tonight. I hope that what I've put together um, is, is worthwhile for you to hear. Sometimes I worry when I when I join groups that I've, I've got some things, but everybody's kind of heard those before. So hopefully there's something new here that maybe you've heard of. And then I, of course, and I wanna weave, I wanna weave the green chemistry because as my boss who is here and he won't say anything now, but uh, he's here and he's the one that got me involved with this. So he's, he'll be the first one to hopefully point out what I've done wrong, Doug. Anyway, um, I don't know, <laughs> what are you doing? You need him leave? <laughs> All of a sudden he's gone. Oh no, there he is. Okay. Um, but anyway, I, I wanna kind of weave some, some green chemistry ideas, whether they're great ideas or not, that's up to all of you to decide if it's if it's really good green ideas. But uh, some of the demonstrations that we do, um, I, I think, use good principles. And then I'm going to also try to talk a little bit about how some of our classes that we have for uh, uh, master's degree science teachers who who are interested in getting a master's degree in chemistry? We have we have an introduction to safety course. We have a course on uh, disposal of chemicals, and uh, we have a course on demonstrations, and we have a course on writing chemical hygiene plans. So uh, the idea being that we would like to promote some safety principles, which you know concur with with green chemistry principles as well. And, uh, and hopefully all of this together uh, is, is worth the storytelling. So all that said, let me share my screen. I'm gonna share my PowerPoints, there they go. And let's see, I hope they, hopefully they came up and I'll do that. 
So I, I, um, I don't do this alone. Um, the SDSU Science Concepts Illustrations or Science Squad um, is, uh, is really a, a, a couple of different people. Um, it's changed over the years, but there's been one main person and that's Dr. Larry Browning. He's out of, out of physics. Now, part of our department as well. This, this year we've actually joined with our physics department. And so we are the Department of Chemistry, Biochemistry and Physics. And Dr. Larry Browning has been doing outreach. Uh, he was doing outreach um, here in South Dakota when I was still teaching in Wisconsin, was teaching high school there. So he's been here for quite a while. Um, and when I got here, he kind of took me under his wing and said, here, come, let's do these things. And, and, and that's what we've been doing ever since. So um, I just kind of want to talk about some of the things we've talked about and tried to do in some of our, our outreach type things. You know, here's here's our here's our outreach group that uh, from several years ago. This is actually mm, this might be this might be two years ago, maybe three years ago already. Um, this is a group of undergraduates who went with us, and we spent a, an all day session with uh, with mostly elementary kids, but it was at a at a spooky science event. Um, which you'll see a lot of pe a lot of pictures probably come from that. Um, but this is the group that's there. What I what I kind of want to just hit on is, well, why do we conduct the outreach? You know, what are our theory, theoretical approaches? Uh, which, of course, you know, I don't know how everybody else feels. These are our theoretical approaches. Whether we actually stick to them or not is a good question. We really need somebody watching over our our shoulders. Doug, you should have you should have been watching more close, closely. And. Uh, you know, and, and then we've involved a number of, of, of people. We've had undergraduates. So all of the students standing there in that picture are the undergrads that have worked with or that worked with us that year. We've had graduate students. We've had high school students and, and, and middle school students. Um, that said, the middle school students were actually faculty members, uh, children, one of them specifically, Dr. Larry Browning. I'll, 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 uh, I'll, point out, I'll point out his daughter when that picture comes up. And, and then we've had secondary science teachers being involved it, with us as well. So we've had a variety of people involved. You know, why do we conduct the, the outreach? You know, we, we believe it's essential that the STEM community um, remember that there's an importance to science and mathematics literacy. That said, I am giving, I, I'm not giving a talk. I'm just, I'm sitting with a group of Sioux Falls science teachers at 7 p.m. tonight. We're in the middle of reading a book. We we were reading a book, kind of doing a science book club thing, and uh, we chose a book. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say what the book is right now. Um, we're all a little bit annoyed with the book at this point because the book has basically said everything that we've wanted to do is not true. In fact, what uh, one of the things that Aaron mentioned about we need to develop more workforce. This author actually suggests. We're already creating the workforce we need. It goes against everything that, but but we're reading the book. We said we're gonna. We picked it out. We thought it would be a good one. There's still one more section to go, and we're hoping things change. But they've said it's really about the fact that we have to change how we teach because we're we're really not meeting certain goals. If you want to get, if you want to talk to me later about it, because I've still got to read that last section. What does this person want to do? But anyway, um, it's 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 a bit concerning. I do believe that we do need to promote literacy, um, green chemistry literacy, yes, but science literacy as a whole. And I and I and I put this here, um, this tritium example, um, for this reason. I was listening to, as it turned out to be Minnesota public radio, but it could have been any public radio because I think it was a national broadcast. Well, no, it wasn't. It was Minnesota because they were talking about the nuclear power plant north northwest of Minneapolis up towards St. Cloud. And they were discussing that there had been a report that had come out about the tritium uh, release uh, that took place. You did notice how I pronounced the tritium release um, that took place and people should be concerned. Now, okay, they pronounced the word wrong, but in the end, 
then what were they what did they really know about the situation they were reporting it and they were reporting misinformation because they were you know what they said was acceptable i believe there were some some aspects of the report that were concerning uh, to me and uh, so it just reminded me we we need to promote literacy so that's why we conduct outreach we try to have fun so uh, okay so this was uh, this was at white river uh, South Dakota, we uh, a, a group of Native American students that were there, and we were we were trying to have fun. Um, some some people are can can be uh, can be over the top, I think. So anyway, so that was me having some fun with great goggles, and and then this was more at the uh, at the sci at, uh, at the spooky science event. Um, I, I know it's spooky science because I only wear that yellow costume. Uh, at that one because uh yeah i don't think it, i don't think it's acceptable anywhere else so uh i don't know i i, I can't quite see that picture i gotta get this out of the way oh yeah okay um what we were trying to do there was wrap people up in a in a bubble um so there was a, a, a children's swimming pool we had a a mixture of soap bubbles and a you just kind of have to play with the mixture until the soap bubbles get strong enough. And then we had a hula hoop. And then you get the, 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 the student, the, the, the child to go stand in the middle. We had some bricks that were up in the air so they could walk to the middle without walking through the bubble solution. They stood in the middle and then we would raise the hula hoop and they were now in the middle of their bubble. And uh, of course they had a lot of fun. Uh, what were we teaching? Probably not a lot other than we were having a lot of fun. Uh, but we also, if they were there long enough, they knew we were we were working at trying to strengthen the forces that were holding those bubble that bubble solution together. The students had to work pretty hard at doing it. Anyway, we like to have fun. Um, all right, uh, that didn't move on. What's going on here? Oh, it's a video. I didn't realize that was a video. Let's see what that. Oh, oh, see, there's the bubble. Yeah, you see the bubble. Oh, all right, try that one more time. <laughs> okay, and they all got wet with the bubble solution too. So, all right, that's why it didn't go on. Okay, all right, so there we moved, but why didn't the pictures go away? Did you do, something's happened here. I, okay, that's this. Not sure well, something's happening to my PowerPoint. That should now all those. Oh well, okay. All right. I guess I, I guess it's okay. Um. So I do want to bring this up. We we do have models for creative engagement. We tr we try to think about how are these students participating. What are they thinking about? So there's actually two models that we've been trying to use. Um, visual thinking skills and notice and wonder. And that's why when they said, oh, we've been talking about this notice and wonder, it kind of hit me that well, maybe we could say some things. So these are the, the models that we talk about. Now, theoretically, theoretically, I think it matches in a particular book that uh, I read with a group of science teachers. Uh, again, I had mentioned that we have a master's degree program for science teachers in chemistry. And one of our classes the only class about teaching is a, is a class on, on uh, chem chemistry teaching strategies. And my philosophy in there is find a couple of books and let's read the books and talk about them. We do some projects, but, but, but particularly um, this book we read a few years back and it was teaching creative thinking. And in this book, there was a particular um, model that they described in terms of well, how do we get how do we get students to think creatively? And out of this model that you see pictured here, um, there were three kind of important things in that that connected to what we try to do in in outreach. There was um, crafting and improving, making connections, and then wondering and questioning. Which of course you know notice and wonder kind of wraps right up into that that idea. So. This model kind of gave us some support into terms of what we were thinking. Okay, it's not gonna go forward to try that. Okay, 
So crafting and improving. Um, there was one event that we held. So what you're seeing here in this picture is a group of high school students who signed up for an honors program a few years back. Doug will remember this, I believe. Um, and what you are seeing is the three students here are working with a graduate student. And what their task is, is to try some chemical demonstrations. And, and, and we were trying to make them work a little bit better. And then the ultimate goal was we had a demonstration show for all of the honors group of students. And these students got to perform their demonstration in front. And so Amanda, our graduate student here, is working with them to try to help them to develop their and learn how to do their demo the correct way, but then also even what, what changes could we make? So they were crafting and trying to improve it so that they could themselves do it. Um, I was working with one of the students here. Again, she was, she was practicing her demonstration. Um, and so who knows what I was saying. Um, and here's Amanda again. So this student has put together some solutions and Amanda's teaching him, okay, here are the steps you now take to, to, to do this forward. Each one of those are, are typical demonstrations that we would do. The one that he's working on right there is, is the iodine clock demonstration. Oh, and here they all are now. Of course, uh, people might cringe at this. So, but if you'll notice, this is the Culligan bottle. And we have practiced this several different times over the course of that week. And so the students knew exactly how they would go about doing this correctly and safely. Uh, and so he is bringing the match up to the top very carefully and dropping it in. And, and if you'll notice the line of students behind him, everybody was going to get a chance to do their Culligan uh, bottle, the, the whoosh ball ex experiment. They learned how to do it. They, we talked about the safety of doing it. We talked about, um, you know, okay, what, what kind of chemicals are being produced? Hopefully, mostly just carbon dioxide and water. Um, but we talked about handling the chemicals safely, which, which meets one of those green chemistry principles that I had mentioned before. So I want to talk about vis visual thinking skills. I don't know how many of you have heard of visual thinking skills. Um, we have used this in our, we, Larry and I, and a, and a biology instructor, Madhav Nepal, we have been teaching a course for secondary education teachers uh, that are planning to be teachers. They're undergraduates. They're working through the teacher education curricula. And we teach uh, the, the methods class. And one of our evening sessions that we have is we go to our, our museum. We have an art museum on campus. And the art director there has actually worked with his visual thinking skills a number of, for a number of years. And they put us through um, kind of a, a practice of this. If you want to see the, um, the, the visual thinking strategies home, there's the link. And I believe uh, Aaron is going to post that in the chat so you can, you can get that. But it talks about how the idea is to look at a, a piece of art and try to imagine the story that's taking place. And so when you get the students in front of the piece of art, they're asked to think about, to, to look at what they're seeing. And, and, and basically there's like three questions that go with it. Of course, I didn't think about, about writing down exactly the wording, but essentially it is, what do you see in the picture? And so they, you start off with getting the students to say, well, this is what I see. But then you ask them to, can you elaborate on that? Can you tell us more? Is there more? And then finally, after telling us what you see, elaborating what you see, is there a story that goes with it? Now, we do this with our science teachers because it's our thinking that, that we can do the same thing by looking at a demonstration using these same principles. So if I show a demonstration, you could then say, well, okay, um, 
here is here's what I'm seeing. So I'm going to try that. So I'm going to switch this to a different camera, hopefully. I'll have to sh stop my share, I believe. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to sh I'm going to shift my my camera. I shut it off. I'm going to shift it to this. And then everybody might want to pin it to make it larger and I hope what you're seeing is there we go. Can you see? Okay, yeah, you can see it. That's good. Okay, perfect. Now, it likes to follow me. So I'm going to stop it from following me. Just one second. Got to go in and find my owl. Okay. Owl. There we go. And I want to adjust my, my owl and point this towards my beakers. There we go. No, 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 Go back. Chemistry bird. Yes, thank you. Sorry about this. I forgot that I needed to do this. Mm. Well, okay. So I I will I will try this I'll try this a different way because I can't seem to make it so so the owl likes to follow the person making noise so I'll just bring the beakers over here so here's my first beaker okay and uh, so I'm I've already got a chemical dissolved in it so that chemical that I've dissolved in it is potassium iodide um, but if I were going to have my students try to think about this with visual thinking strategies. I want them to try to imagine what's what's maybe taking place. So maybe I would tell them what's in here. But what I want to do is I want to make this turn blue. Okay. So to do that, I've got to add two liquids. I'm going to pour them in. So there we go. All right. So I've added the two liquids, and the result is it's going to turn blue. Now, the nice thing is that it happens fairly quickly. So watch it. So watch it. Can you see that it's starting to turn blue now? Okay. Can you see that? Oh, it's a little bit harder on screen. See, if you were in person, you'd see that I was holding it up against my shirt, and now it looks like the liquid is blue. Students never buy that either. All right. So it hasn't turned blue. So now what I need to do is I need a little bit of power, a little bit of energy. So I'm going to drop my battery in, and maybe if I wasn't in front of it, you'd see it a little bit better. Oh, see, there you go. So now you can see the blue. If I were showing this to a student, I might say, well, what, what are you seeing? Why is this happening? Can you, can you try to create a story or draw a picture of what is taking place in this beaker, we can clearly see that that we're producing the blue. And if you look carefully, the blue is being produced at one of the terminals. You can't quite see it as well, but at the other terminal, there is bubbling taking place. So it's clearly an oxidation reduction reaction of these things taking place inside that beaker. So the idea here is that I would take them through a series of, of demonstrations where they would see something. And then imagine what is taking place. Part of, part of one of the things about teaching is that the students just can't think at that microscopic level. They can't, you know, they can't think of what's going on. So to me, if, if something is happening like this, the students can then at least try to relate and, and, and imagine something taking place. And if we, they can imagine it then, and, and they can put it on paper, then we can work with that and try to improve their their model of what they're thinking about. So that is that is kind of the the start of the blue battery. There's a whole bunch of other things, but I have noticed that I've 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 lingered. So I better keep on going. So the idea is that we can use the visual thinking strategies to get students to observe something, and then try to explain what is taking place. So visual thinking strategies. That's that's kind of what's going on there. So do I still, I'm not sharing yet. Okay, so I'll go back. Matt, they're asking about the title of the book. 
Oh, the title of of which book? I don't know. That, that was the question. Me, Katrina, can you let me share my screen again? I want to share that. So I think it's the visual thinking book. Right here. Yeah, yeah that's creative one. thinking. That oh, where'd it go? I'll there put that is. in the chat. It is uh teaching creative thinking. That is the title, and the authors are um Bill uh, Bill Lucas and Ellen Spencer. Okay. It's uh it's been around for a bit. Is I think the first time I read this in the in the in the class, it was probably 2016, 2017. So so this book has been around for a bit, but it's it's a really good book about trying to think about helping helping students to think more creatively. And that's that's part of what this class we try to do. Yes, we talk about teaching science. But then we also try to talk about some other aspect. This year, we're reading a book um, about, let's uh, see, what, oh, now it no, just totally left me. It's not really about creative thinking. It's it's more along the lines of, um, um, well, it's, I guess it's called critical thinking. It's just a, another book, kind of a similar line of thinking um, that we do. So we, we have those those two lines of, of thinking every week as we read both books in the, in the course. All right, so, so that's visuals, uh, teaching strategies. We, we talk about the, the idea is that we find meaning in imagery, and I think that chemistry has a lot of imagery. So you can use your demonstrations, you can use your examples. There's images in there that can help you to, to get the students to, to imagine what's going on. Now, oh, and so um, here's, a, here's an example of a graduate student, and here would be an, a, a nice example. Here, she was using zinc and iodide, right? So this was a very nice synthesis reaction. If you mix a little bit of solid iodine and zinc, make sure that the iodine is crushed nicely. Um, put one drop of water on it, and you get that burst of beautiful purple iodine, which Yes, from a green concept, it's maybe not the best thing. It does it does have some toxic concepts. So one drop, you put it up, and, and but it's it's not terribly a terribly toxic material. So we're and we're gonna talk a little bit about that later, um, because I have some tables that we use in our in our uh, waste disposal class that I'm gonna bring up. Notice and wonder. Um, I don't know how much have, have you talked about Annie Fetter at all? As you talked about Notice and Wonder. Okay, this was this was an awesome uh, video video that uh, that she made, and uh, I, hopefully this works. It's a, I, I hope it works. We'll see. Is it coming up for everybody? Does everybody hear it? No. Okay. No. So that. No, not yet. Okay, that figures. So, all right, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to exit out of the share. I'll put it in here. So since it was a YouTube, it's taking me outside. Okay, there we go. Now, if I share this, hopefully it works. Okay, so share. There we go. So Annie Fetter, she's a math person. And uh, this was... A presentation she made and, and got posted. So here, I'll let her do the talking. So uh, at the math forum, we worry a lot about Hear problem that okay? solving and kids thinking about math and kids thinking that they can do math. And I'm going to talk a little bit about ways in which we do that. Right. So long, long ago, sometime in the mid '90s, I was on an airplane and I was flying to Detroit, and I was going to do a sketchpad workshop. Okay. So I gave up my window seat to a three-year-old. And so his dad sat in the middle. It was late at night. It, the picture should be at night, but I couldn't find one. So, and the kid's looking out the window and he's going, dad, what's that? And dad, being a good dad, is answering him. So, oh, it's this, it's this. And he, this goes on for a while. What's that? What's the dad answers? That's great. At some point, dad apparently wasn't paying attention. And so he says, what's that, dad? And, um, and I turn and I said to the kid, well, um, what do you think it is? And, and he can't 
Yes, I don't remember what it was, but I know it was profound. And so the rest of the flight went on like that. He's saying, you know, well, what's that? And we said, what do you think it is? And eventually he doesn't ask anymore. He just starts talking about what he's seen out the window, right? And so later on, we're walking through baggage claim, and I, I went ahead, and they caught up with me, and the guy says to me, I listened to the way that you talked to my kid, and you really made him think. I was, it was right. I'm going to talk to my son differently from now on. Thank you. All right? So, all right. Oh, oh, so I mean, right? That, that's really also the visual thinking strategies, right? The questions we ask get them to think about things, and then and then I like this one too. So I'm gonna... Sorry, so I'm going and I'm going to do a model problem solving with an eighth grade class, and the teacher says to me, "Now these are our lowest eighth graders, so don't expect too much." Okay, so I drew this on the board, and um, and I asked them to write down things that they notice about the picture. All right. So they're writing and they're writing and, and uh, they're in some, then we said, we're going to share some stuff that you notice. All right. So we start gathering things together and uh, we start recording things on the board. And I know that you are all noticing things because that's what you do, right? You're noticing things about this picture. All right. So we start making a list. So is your thing on this list? Okay. Here's a list of things that they noticed. All right. It's very mathematical. These are kids who cannot do math, remember. Okay. Um, and they've come up with all this mathematics. All right. Their teacher's standing in the back, sort of you know, picking her job from the floor. So, and there are a couple of things on the list that I asked him, could you say more about? So one of them said, well, it used to be a square. And so I asked him to come up and he drew a little box to show what he meant by that. And then another kid said, well, it can be split into two rectangles. And so he came up and he drew a line to show us how it could be split into two rectangles. For homework, they all got the problem and they were asked to write down things they remembered. Some of them actually solved the problem even though they didn't have to. It was about tiles and stuff. And the teacher sent me this excited email like, my kids actually did mathematics. And I'm like, uh-huh, see, see? Right, asking the questions to engage them in it and get them to think about what it could be. But whether it's exactly right is not all that important. Honestly, that is what the book author that we're reading in my group that I'm going to meet with in, in about a half an hour. That's what he's saying. It's not, it's not all about them being right and remembering stuff. It's about them just trying it and just getting involved and engaged in it. Yeah, we want them to be right, but if we can engage them somehow, notice and wonder the VTS, it's engaging them to think about what the possibilities are. And so and, and, and that's what we like to try to see our students do when we're engaged with them uh, in our in our outreach. What happened? Wait, there it is. Okay. So, oops. Did I share it? Is that it? Did it come back? Is that my PowerPoint? Yep. Okay. It's back. But I'll get to this. Okay. So notice and wonder again, just this, this idea of we want them to, to think about it. This so here is here was an outreach event that we were doing. Now, this particular year, I had two undergraduate students, chemistry students. Actually, I think they were biochemistry. That doesn't matter. They came to me and said, We would like to do an educational thing. I said, Well, that's fine. Have you made sure that the department head is okay with this? Because you're a biochemist and you want to do an educational research concept. Doug, I believe you said yes. Anyway, um, so the if you notice, if you notice the girl in front of me, she's walking this way, a little bit taller. She's right in front of the students. That is that is one of the undergrads. The other one is standing back. Um, to the far right, okay? And then there's Amanda again. We've seen her in several pictures. She was our graduate student doing a lot of the stuff. Now, I want, you to, I want you to notice the students that are in front. They're standing there with goggles on. Do you see that? We had called them up to do, a, I guess I say this loosely, an experiment. Maybe I should, an experiment, right? We're doing an experiment. The experiment was oxalic acid and potassium permanganate. Two, if you're thinking about green, they're okay. It's got manganese in it, but we can handle it if we handle it properly. Okay. So you'll notice that there are three hot plates there. So two of the hot plates we were warming. The other hot plate, um, 
we actually had had it sitting there, but it wasn't plugged in. It had ice on it. So one was being cooled, a couple were being heated, and one was kept at room temperature. Now, do you also notice the cards that the kids are holding? So we posed questions to the students before they did the experiment. What do you think will happen if we do this? And so they, so we, and, and, and that's what the undergraduate girl is doing. She's walking across them with her phone because these are called plicker cards. So if they hold them one way, the answer is A. If they hold it another way, the answer is B, C, and D. If they just, they just turn the card and then our undergraduate would sweep with her phone and capture the answers to the questions. And we had, we had the questions and the answers posted in another place that you can't see. Just so that you know, I'll just do this real quick. This was the experiment that they were doing. This is uh, Amanda. She actually set this up. And Jackie, our, our uh, lab technician here, our person in charge of the building um, and safety and all those things. This is a four times the speed. So here. Hundred and fifty to the right. Boom! That's what that that happened. That's seventy-five degrees on the right, and the second one to the right. Room temperature on the left, and it's simply oxalic acid and uh, and and potassium permanganate, and the reaction produces this beautiful color change. And when it's clear, the reaction has gone to completion. And it's a wonderful way to talk about. Kinetic motion, the motion of particles. Why is the hot one going faster? All that. And that was the question that we were posing to our students. That's enough. Okay. Boy, that lab is loud. Anyway, so so that was that was what we were doing there. Let me go back. That's what the students, that's the exact experiment that the students were doing standing behind the table. At one after we collected the information, they then poured the, the liquids together, and they found out whether what they thought was going to happen was right. And then we just we talked a little bit about it. These were elementary students, so we couldn't go into high level, but we could talk about motion of particles. And the hot ones were moving faster. Therefore, the reaction happened faster. And, uh, and we collected the data, and that's what the undergraduates did. They reviewed the data, and they wrote about how they felt this process took place, whether the students, because we would ask questions afterward to see if now they were, we did not, didn't do it right away afterwards. At the end of the entire session, we asked a few more questions collected and we saw if they remembered those ideas. So the notice and wonder here was, here's this experiment. What do you think is going to happen? Answer the questions. And then there's that. Oh, oh I didn't mean to do that. All right, move on. Um, and then there's just some um, uh, another graduate student working. We were do, we were doing a, a big Sioux water festival. I believe they're making. S oh no, I know what they're doing there. They're doing a they're doing a discrepant event. So do you see the flasks? Their task was to take the green liquid and put it into one flask. Take the uh, into uh, into and took the the clear liquid in another one and then pour them into a third flask that was twice as big as them. And the, the question was, if you pour two things together of equal volume, do you get the same volume? And it turned out you didn't because they were different chemicals. And then we talked about, well, why would that be the case? Why? Because they're different chemicals and so they fit together better. That was our conversation. It's really intermolecular forces, so it's a great way to kind of think about that. Um, oh, well, we, we have uh, one of our graduate students uh, on the non-Newtonian fluid. Um, we, we considered putting the students up there, but we decided that was a, that was a risk. Uh, but the graduate students said, oh, well, we'll do it. Uh, I said, okay. So, but we have people standing around making sure. But non-Newtonian fluid, she was standing on it, she'd sink. But if she walked on it, she didn't sink, right? So that that whole idea there. Um, I just put this one in because our audience members aren't always elementary students. Sometimes they're old deans. You see that, Doug? Dean Jorgensen came and watched us at Spooky Science. So, uh, so we were being monitored. See, we were being monitored. 
And oh, I believe this one was a physics demonstration of of a chain that falls out. And 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 uh, oh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, oh well, of course the exploding pumpkin with uh, calcium carbide and water. You make acetylene and you can blow it out. So that I don't think we had, that's not a video. Um, oh, we did uh, we did the rainbow connection. Um, we actually did play. Um, uh, what, what's the green frog's name? Um, Kermy. We played Kermy's song, The Rainbow Connection. But at, at this event, there's all sorts of things going on. They couldn't hear it. But, but we heard it. So it was giving us a background to, to follow. So anyway, we did, a, we did a variety of things. Again, undergrads. So there's lots of people involved, um, and lots of audiences. We've been all over the state. In fact, last week, uh, we went to a, a middle school on the south side of Sioux Falls in Harrisburg. We were um, we were in we were doing a, a, a water festival event in Sioux Falls, and then we were actually at Lower Brule schools. Uh, it's I think our third time going to the Lower Brule uh, Tribal School. Uh, we were back out there over our spring break on last Thursday, uh, doing doing a variety of different things and just trying to engage them in these ideas. So, I mean, it's essential that we that we get the community involved, that we do these things. Um, it's essential for us to try to make it fun, make it interactive, but we also have to make them think about what they're doing. Think about it, engage in the in the thought process, um, and then we can talk about green things if that moment happens. For example, so I'll do one more because I know it's 6.45 and I believe that uh, there's other things that you want to do. So I'll do one more thing. I'll do one more thing. I've, I'm going to shut this down. Oh well, here I'll finish this out just real quickly. We do have the cast of our of our side squad. That was from 2009. The reason why I wanted to show this: Do you see the blonde girl, uh, second from the left? Um, that is Dr. Browning's daughter. She is now working on her PhD in sustainable um, energy uh, from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, she's working on trying to develop ways to generate electricity from the flowing water of the, I uh, forget the name of the river that goes through Fairbanks, but that's what she's been working on. And being able to develop it and up, you know, up, upgrade it, make it bigger and, and make it useful to, uh, to Fairbanks. So she's uh, very much involved. The rest of them, many of them are, are high school teachers somewhere. Um, there we've seen that picture. That's Amanda. Um, she was very much involved. There we are again, um, doing the same thing. And there was, and that wasn't our last one. That was two years ago. Uh, I didn't get our last one up there. So yeah, there's my yellow costume thing. So we, there's many, there's been many people involved. I'm not going to go into this, but if you want to go to um, our website, we do have a master's degree in chemistry for, te for teachers. Um, and, uh, and then we have a series of safety courses and the demonstration class. Um, that, that I had mentioned before, but I want to do one thing because we can talk about it from a green aspect because I promised to do something green and I probably have it. So um, I will, I will do that. So I need to, sh I need to do this. Okay. I stopped that. I don't want to do it. Let's go to this camera. Do you see the ceiling? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I don't know how many of you have seen the the uh, the sunset demonstration, the chemical sunset demonstration, but I'm going to do it two ways. So my first step is to turn off the lights a bit. I'm going to leave that one on. There we go. Okay, turn off the lights, but I'm going to turn on a flashlight. Do you now see the flashlight up on the ceiling? Yes. Okay. Now, I'm going to place a beaker on top of a of a ring here. It's the iron ring, but there's nothing on it, so I hopefully won't drop it off in the middle of all this. Okay, and can you see that the 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 that the flashlight is going straight through it? Can you see that it's not? I guess it's not bad. Is that better? It is. Of, I don't know. All right. So there we go. So now, the the chemical in here is is uh, sodium thiosulfate. I will send Aaron, uh, uh, there's a table that we use in our chemical disposal uh, course 
uh, that talks about low tox and high tox ions. Thiosulfate and sodium are on the low tox list. So this is an okay demonstration. The other thing that I need to add is a little bit of, of hydrochloric acid. Now, the actual recipe calls for concentrated hydrochloric acid. I went, I really don't like to, to, to use concentrated hydrochloric when I'm out on the road at a demonstration show. So I went, does it work if it's a little bit less concentrated? And it does. I'm gonna put two molar, just a little bit more than what they would say. I'm gonna put about 20 milliliters of two molar hydrochloric acid in. So there we go. And we'll watch, we'll watch for changes, okay? I'm gonna take this away from the ceiling and I'm gonna point it at the beaker for a, for a moment, okay? And see if you see any changes that take place. In fact, I think the changes are, are starting to take place right now. Maybe, I don't know, I guess the light's over there, over okay. Gotta give it a little bit of time. Maybe not quite yet. It's called the chemical sunset because it affects the ability of the light to pass through. It's a Tyndall effect um, uh, demonstration. So as the hydrochloric acid reacts, now I think it starts, do you see the blue starting to come in? The blue light is starting to scatter. Now I'm gonna go back and I want you to see the ceiling. So I'll go back to the ceiling. The blue light is starting to go through or is starting to be scattered. But if the blue light gets scattered, the light that you see on the ceiling, maybe I need to come up here. Can you, okay, can you see that the light in the middle is changing color? Because if you block out the blue light, only the red light and the oranges will come through. And that's of course what happens for our sunsets. We see these colors at sunset and sunrise because the light is being scattered through, the blue light is being scattered as it enters. But for us at, you know, as the sun is going down, that sun is a long ways away from us. So most of the blue light has been scattered and we now, oh, look at that. It's almost blocking almost all the light now. So it's, it's, it's blocking it out entirely. Oh, and if we go back to, we go back to the beaker, you've seen all, all that we've done is we've created larger particles. Now, we had to use chemicals, hydrochloric acid, sodium thiosulfate, to make this happen. So can we do this green? The answer is yes. So here is a bottle of water. It's a little bit bigger one. Almost fell off. Woo, okay, there we go. All right, so there's a, a little bit bigger bottle of water. And instead of adding the hydrochloric acid and the, I'm gonna, add, oh, you can't see it because uh, I have the lights off. This is Anthem non-dairy creamer. Okay, you can have any non-dairy creamer you want, but I, I needed to do the commercial. All right, so I've got, the da I've got this, this dairy, this non-dairy creamer. Turns out that if you use dairy, the fat kind of gets in the way. It's kind of cool, but the fat gets in the way. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of it. I got some in here, and I'm going to just put just a few grains into. So there we go. I did. Oh, here they come. Oh, that this is a cool part, too. I like this part. See them falling and dissolving. That's so cool. If you did this for your students, Again, visual thinking strategies. So what are you seeing here? Tell me. Okay, tell me a little bit more. What more detail is out there? Can you, can you provide a story of what's going on? Now, all that is happening. At the same time, the color is changing up above. And in fact, if you look at that closely around the creamer, it's kind of a blue, kind of blue around the, because we are scattering blue light. And we were actually changing the color up there. Maybe if I add a little bit more, I don't know. Larry said, don't add too much. All right. So, okay, maybe I add too much. So there we go. Put some more creamer in there. And again, we're getting, we're getting color changes on the ceiling because we are scattering the blue light, but the red light is coming through.
all done with water and non-dairy creamer instead of sodium thiosulfate and hydrochloric acid. So your green chemistry concept could be, when I'm doing my demos, is there something else that I could use to make it a little bit more green? All right. I think I have sufficiently uh, taken more time than you wanted, so I should be done. So I will put that down, and uh, I'll come back. There's a couple that questions in the chat. chat. Um, All right, so, uh, let me go ahead and share. There's one asking you about there. I guess you shared two books, and so they want to know about the second book. I think the that's the book that you're. I think that's the book that you're reading right now in your current class. Oh, okay. All right. Um, let's see. Yeah, I've got. I've got it right here in my my Kindle here. Just a second. Well, I'm. I've got another group that I'm going to be meeting with here shortly, and we are. This is the book that I'm kind of. We're kind of at odds with. Um, the title of that one is Why We Teach Science and Why We Should. It's written by John Rudolph, and it came out in 2023. So I'll I'll, I'll type that into the chat here just a second. And it, I can uh, type it. You got it in yeah. there? Why We Teach Science by John L. Rudolph. He's a, an educator at uh, the University of Wisconsin, um, and he makes some interesting points. And he says some things that I go, oh, I've been thinking that way all along. And now you're telling me maybe that's not true. So anyway, it's, it's, it, if you read the book, be prepared to be, oh, come on, tell me something else. Okay, the other one, let me go there. The other one, library. What was the name of the other one that we were doing? Um, So right now in the book that in the class that we're that we're having we're re we're reading the book developing creativity in the classroom um, by Kettler yeah here here let me uh, can I share my screen here maybe I can share that yeah there it is here's my Kindle list all right hopefully is, uh, everything's okay there there's a uh, oops oh I opened it up. Uh, cover. There we go. Cover. There we go. This is the one we're reading in there right now. Uh, developing creativity in the classroom. Um, it's It's got some interesting points. Um, it doesn't talk just about science. It actually talks about math and, and liberal arts and, 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 and has, has suggestions for a variety of things, of which, not surprisingly, many of the suggestions are very similar. And a lot of them follow the the visual the visual thinking strategy the the uh, notice and wonder concepts so so that's that's what we've been reading in the in the class lately and like I said we were reading the 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 other one on the, by by Spencer and Lucas uh, before so thank you and then there's one more question from okay. Rashi Kapil um, could you suggest some tools where students can draw a model. Um, they work with students in the asynchronous online environment. Um, so in my face-to-face -face class, I, I, I bought 400 whiteboards. I didn't charge them the department, Doug, as far as you know. Anyway, um, so uh, no, no, I did not. I did not. Um, so I bought these whiteboards and I've been using them in my face-to-face -face class. And if there is, and I really find that when they draw things out, it helps them to, to see things. So just the other day in one of the classes, I said, you know, they were asked, we we're talking about the intermolecular forces and I could tell that they really, okay, where is this intermolecular force? I said, so let's draw what's happening. Can you draw what's happening to the electron cloud around the molecule? Show me what's happening. And so they drew that. I said, now draw another molecule next to it. How will that electron cloud be affected? Having the ability to draw things out. So if in an in a online class, and if it's asynchronous, they could send you a picture of what they think. Send me a picture of what you think, and then I can talk about it. But But sometimes if... If I can't see what they're thinking, it's hard for me to really help them to, to maybe 
try something different. So picture it, you know, just, just drawing pictures. I think it's very important. Uh, I was in a review session just before this session and we were doing gas law problems. And of course their statement, well, how do I know which one of those formulas to use? It's seven o'clock. I said, well, first you need to know what you know. Have you ever written them down? Do you ever write down what you know? And they're, well, it's right there in the problem. I said, yes, but you don't, you haven't assigned what it is. You haven't said, oh, that's P1. Oh, that's V1. That's P2. Oh, now you know what you need because you, you've just assigned things. So um, to me, to me, in an online situation, it's best when they can draw things out um, and, and share different things. Okay. I, Maybe maybe I could leave this. This is what I did last night with the group of teachers in that class, in the class on, on teaching strategies. Um, we were talking about one thing that is a good method, a, a good thing to try to do is to leave them with something to think about. So I was, I was trying to come up with something. Okay, how am I going to find something that the, these teachers that I could at least – get them to, to ponder it a little bit. So I said to myself, okay, what, what, what would be fairly easy to find? Um, and then they can, they can watch it. So a video, so a, a video would be good. And then I got to thinking we were doing gas laws. I was trying to think about things I could use. There's a scene in the movie Martian, the Martian that bothers me with respect to gas laws. So here, let me share that. I've got it pulled up just for this reason. I, I went, oh, maybe I could use that. So here, where, where is that? Uh, of course, it's not up there. I've got to find it. Just a second. Uh, uh, where'd it go? Okay, While you're finding that, I'm just going to diddle the vertical, the whiteboards. That's what I use with my students all the time. And there's some research that really supports having kids model things that they're unsure about on non-permanent surfaces just makes them more just willing to take some risks and even if they don't have any idea what's going on but start to tell a story okay that's my problem okay there it is okay there okay so now I'll go back to zoom share my screen here he is okay you recognize that the martian i have a problem with this Oxygen level critical. Oxygen level critical. Oxygen level critical. Okay, right there. Okay, that's that's far enough. Okay, why do I have a problem with this? So I, I gave it to the teachers and said, I actually sent them out to breakout rooms. I said, you've got five minutes to come up with what you think is my problem with this. They all came back and said, well, if there's a hole in the suit, how can there be any air inside that suit? Now, one of them said, well, maybe the suit has inside, just like we have our automobiles now. If we puncture our tire, there's the, inside they have the resealable whatever. I don't know. It's crazy stuff. I said, maybe they're making their suits out of that now. I don't know. But they they all came back and said, it's a gas law thing. They all they all quickly said what it was. But to me, if I can find something like this and go, it connects, it's a movie. They see it. They like it. But now it actually has some science there. Um, the the one of one of the groups came back and said, Yeah, why why aren't his eyes getting big like in like in uh in uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's what was that movie he went to the Mars on, right? He and he fell right. So that's an old one back anyway. So just that whole idea about that. Total recall, yeah, okay, yeah, Katrina, total recall. There you go, that's the one. All right. Other other questions. I, I know that now I've really gone beyond what you wanted me to do. So all wonderful, Matt. Don't worry. <laughs> Anything else? I probably should now wander off to my other group that started at seven. 
So, yes. But, so but, but, me... there are, but, but there are high school teachers from Sioux Falls. They know each other, so they're talking, so they're fun. Thanks, well, thank you Matt. so, so Matt, much, Matt, for sharing all your expertise and your outreach program. I love all the connections you make with like using phenomena to get kids excited and interested. And it's like an entryway to get into the science and get them wondering and curious and modeling their thinking and then giving them purpose to like figure out like what's actually happening. You know, how do we, how can we use science to explain these things? It's beautiful. So well, thank you. We have, a, the other thing is we have a lot of fun too. And I hope the kids have fun. I, I think that's that's part of it. Um, at the Spooky Science event, we do the demonstrations, but what we actually do for probably half the time is we have a whole bunch of tables set up and the undergraduates that are there with us, they each take a table and they have something there that the kids can play with. And so they help them, you know, Maybe you can make carbon dioxide bubbles here, or we we make rockets over here. Um, the, you know, the, it says the, the, we have a we have a, a fan, an air fan that we can set straight and blow straight up in the air. And then if you take balloons, you can put them into the stream, and they'll stay up there and they'll dance around each other. It's it's a it's beautiful you know example of 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 moving air and and Bernoulli principle. Um, but the kids just like to play with it, right? So anyway. All right. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I am going to have to go. I hope that was what you had in mind. Um, we'll talk that to you. That was amazing. Later. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks, Thank Matt. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> All right. Well, in the interest of time, because I know we've run a little bit over, I mean, again, we'll, we will send you um, this, this video link with Matt's contact information and the, the PowerPoint. Um, I would like to invite everyone to our last um, Observe, Wonder, Think webinar series of our season. So that will happen in four weeks from today, um, April 18th, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern time. And we will hear from Arij uh, Ms. Housky, who is the Green Chemistry Education Manager from Millipore Sigma. Um, again, thank you to all the participants for joining us on this, this Thursday evening in March. Um, we appreciate you sharing your time with us and tuning in, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again next month. Um, good night, everybody, and take care.